Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm your host. I'm delighted to have with me today our special guest, Mrs. Andrea Garcia. Andrea, welcome to the show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here today, and I'm so thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to share about my experiences, but more than anything, to create a space of communication, engagement, and exchange which right now is so important. There are so many tools available that most people are not aware. And I'm so grateful that you have created the space to have those uh, resources to come forward and be able to share with the whole world. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to have you here and I can't wait to get started. So I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit more about you. So everyone, Andrea Garcia is the owner of ProLingual Spanish LLC. It's a company empowering professionals through Spanish training and services. She's a nationally certified healthcare interpreter with more than 10 years of experience in the field. She has experimented with several meditation modalities for 10 years and most recently she's completed her CBCT teacher certification. In addition to that, she has more than 20 years of experience in sales, marketing, and training, and has been working with the Hispanic community since 2002. Andrea, welcome to the show. Welcome to Global Fluency Podcast. We're so thrilled to have you here. And I can't wait for our, our listeners to, to really learn about what you've been up to, what you've been doing in the diversity and inclusion and cultural competence space. Um, and for full transparency, I want them to know also that you and I have a history. Um, you are not only an esteemed and, and highly respected colleague of mine, but you are a dear friend as well. And so when you set forth on this mission of cultural competence, I was delighted uh, because I knew that this was going to be so impactful to not only you as a professional person, but to every community that you serve. And, and that is vast. So I know that the, the place that you are right now is going to provide people with so much information. It's going to show us how to have more authentic communications and conversations. And it's really going to expand not, o not only everyone's knowledge base, but really expand um, their self-actualization. It's really going to create a path for them to find that and, and authentically live in their truth as well as be able to communicate with other people. So let's get started. First, tell us a bit about your professional background, your training, and your company. Absolutely. So my background, uh, it was uh, up to 2008. I was in sales and marketing. And right before the crisis, uh, the 2008 crisis, um, uh, I had a call to just really leave that life behind and find something else. To make the long story short, uh, I always been someone who wanted to serve the community and make a difference. And so I decided to become a medical interpreter. And 2008, from 2008 all the way through to most recently, I spent several hours uh, interpreting all kind of conditions and situations from a school setting, from IPs to a uh, medical setting, you know, different, different types of interpretations. And uh, the amazing part of this is that I have become a filter 
of uh, communication beyond the words, but you know, mostly related to meaning and actually uh, becoming clear about all the misunderstanding that a lot of times takes place that is even beyond any kind of uh, the word specifically, but a uh, consequence as the, um, the system of beliefs that we all of us operate from that creates so many biases and filters that do not allow to, you know, have a, a clear um, communication. And I'm saying all this because the next step uh, professionally, uh, it was, I became also a Spanish teacher because I was aware of the miscommunications. I want to improve that and the professionals who are already fluent in the language, but it was still having some cultural issues that they were not really conveying properly uh, in, in supporting them and growing and expanding their, and their vision so that way they can engage in more uh, accurate conversations. But also, uh, in the process of all this, I met a dear friend, uh, in Samuel Fernandez Carriba, who is a psychologist at Marcos Autism Center, and where I interpret for six years. And, I, and as uh, one of the great consequences of our friendship, I be, became very knowledgeable in this type of meditation that he engaged several years ago, which is called cognitive-based compassion training, for which one I have become a certified trainer back in, the, in, in the last few months. So uh, I think I kind of compacted. Um, one of the things that I just I want to add about my company, you know, my company was created in 2015. And again, I created this company with the intention to provide uh, language services specifically to fill gaps. Uh, there are a lot of companies that teach Spanish, but my intention it was addressing those professionals who really want to create a difference in the environment where they get to practice the language. And, I, and with that intention, I combined my knowledge as a medical interpreter and um, a Spanish teacher to provide services to doctors, to uh, a, lawyers and, uh, and people who really even go to, uh, you know, professional salesmen, um, territorial directors and all kind of things uh, that they have to do with engaging with these different uh, cultures in Latin America mostly uh, and be able to be effective in their intention. So I think I kind of cover everything. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did because that took our listeners through um, the journey, uh, the arc that brought you to the space that you are in today um, as, a, as a certified CBCT trainer. So one of the things that I love that you mentioned was that you, you were, even people who were fluent in the language, they had some difficulties with regard to culture and you in your endeavor to fill that gap, you became that bridge for them through prolingual services, um, through prolingual Spanish, pardon me, through prolingual Spanish, you became the bridge that would, uh, you became the bridge between the space that existed between language and culture. And I think a lot of times, um, especially when we are, we are interacting with people who may not speak another language, sometimes, and, and this goes back to, to our mutual training as interpreters, um, sometimes people think that it's all about the words. As long as you understand the words to say, you're connecting with people um, in a way that, that is relevant to them. But a lot of the times, um, the words can cause more confusion without having a cultural context. So I love that you, you saw a need and you went to fulfill that need. And, in, and throughout this entire thing, you realized that CBCT was also a part of your journey. So can you tell us, um, tell us a little bit about what CBCT is for our listeners, um, for those who may not be familiar? Absolutely. And before I get into that, I want to say something very shortly. Yeah, I've, I left out, you know, the part of that I also been an, interp an, an interpreter trainer in the sense of the language coach. And uh, one of the things that I always said to uh, those who I was training is you need to come to this profession with a humble heart. Mm -hmm. And why I'm saying that, because uh, is on, you can only be in full service when you leave your biases and all the egotistic aspects of ourselves behind, you, uh, you are a tool of communication in there. And you might have all kind of judgments that they going back and forth, uh, 
but really you only have to be aware of them and as you become aware of them you put them to the side you can pick up we always said you know you know this because what we did together so many times you know you leave the suit of who uh, the flamboyant andrea garcia is at the door then you come in in the very you know serene in in uh, um in that highlighting character of being an interpreter you service and then when you go back to your place you put your suit again but you have to really allow all these things to be put on hold because otherwise you're not at service as you should so uh, and with that in mind you know i have to say that cbct my my engagement with cbct came so much as the result of my experience as a medical interpreter uh, First of all, because I want to be better at what I was doing, but also because, you know, there is, there is a moment that we all as an interpreter have a um, find ourselves that is, you know, the, the, to make the decision how much of an advocate I want to be and how far should I go without, you know, breaking the commitment of the role that I have say that I'm going to cover in here and that is it, it keeps me in a place of being compliance with a professional uh, aspect of this and I'm saying all this because it's completely in tune with what CBCT is you know at CBCT it was created at Emory University uh, here in Atlanta Georgia in 2005 by one of the uh, originally he was a monk uh, servicing under the blessings of the Dalai Lama but he was teaching theology in Emory. And in 2005, they have an occurrence of uh, students almost committing suicide or some of them actually committing suicide. And as a concern, one of the students approached this teacher and asked him why this is happening, how you can help. And so he decided to be, create a protocol. You know, at the time he was taking, uh, a, he was becoming a, a PhD in psychology. And so he combined different modalities starting from the Lungen tradition of the Tibetan type of meditation and combined with uh, emotional science and in some other techniques in psychology in creating this completely secular protocol which really allows ourselves to become present about what experiences we have in and in how we can deal with them in a way that leads us to be in a space of more um, a more uh, uh, an, an outcome of uh, of well being of well being not only for us but for all those around us. So um, CBCT basically is that is a type of meditation that is component by six types of modules. Those modules, the two first ones are about the modality called uh, very well known as uh, mindfulness, which basically is about become fully present in the present moment. And then, you know, stabilizing the mind, anchoring the attention, and becoming aware of the mental experience. And then the, the, the next ones are the cognitive base. That's why the CBCT stands for Cognitive Based Compassion Training. And so the, the next modules, you know, we have uh, module three, which is for me was the hardest when I took it, because really, you know, uh, the, the, the situation that we live with any relationship we have is a consequence or is a reflection of the relationship that we have with ourselves. So the third module is about self-care, self-compassion, where we become aware of the different type of uh, conversation that we have in ourselves and how we create in expectations or, or, or we have certain attachments that they're not really reflecting um, the reality that we live, which is, you know, being alive is about uh, constantly to be subject of changes. So life is constantly changing and if we want to anchor something and freeze it to death, we're going to suffer to death because we just want to, you know, keep something from moving when the flow of life is forcing it to move. You know, in the same way, sometimes we want to go, we want to live a day of 48 hours when the day has 24. And so, and we do this without knowing. And all these things are stressors that eventually cause us, you know, to constantly build. And we build resentment, we build all these different emotions that if we don't find a outlet, first of all, to recognize that we have in them. And secondly, to find a way to process them in a way that it really empowers us instead of, you know, freezing us in a place that we don't feel comfortable. So one of the things that I learned when I was taking the training on CBCT is 
we so attached of what sadness or, or, you know, or concern or worry means, where really our emotions are the compass that really allowed us to make decisions that they empower us. Uh, one of the things about meditation is that it gives us the time. So, for example, you know, if you sit for a moment and you try to engage in seeing what is going on in your head, uh, you, what you do is you create a space. And a space where, for example, usually if it's something triggers us, you know, if it's something put us in a specific type of feeling, uh, we have the opportunity to respond instead of reacting. What is the distinction between the two? Reacting means that when we get a stimuli, and if you're thinking in biology, meaning, you know, that's what life makes life, you know, it's the interaction between the individual and the environment. So when something pokes us in a certain way, we tend to react to that based on what we have built as a wine synapse in our brain. But if we stop for a second and we make a wise choice, that means we get the, you know, the stimuli and then we pause for a second where we can make a decision how we're going to respond. The difference between respond and reaction is that it's a gap of time where we can make a choice about how we're going to respond to that stimuli that it has come to us. So this is one of the key things, you know, and that's for uh, module, uh, module three, but then we have module four, which is about impartiality. So once we realize how we engage in a relationship with us and we can be kinder to us, we can be kinder to others. Because again, the, our relationship with our environment is a reflection of whatever relationship we have with us. So when we start to see the others as the same as us and the sense that we all have the intention to be to do good and to be well we can see that all the different perspectives in in system of beliefs that they show up so differently and creates a separation really at the core the intention is the same. And when we get to tap into that, we can relate to others from a very different perspective. And so all those biases that they were playing a game and that we were not aware between the space that we create with the meditation, you know, with the space and mind that we create and the, the, the possibility to see them as another one such as us, when we can connect at the most basic level, it really allowed us to expand. And I'm saying all this because it's so connected about what social competence is. And I don't speak so much about cultural competences, but more social competence, because really there are so many layers about what competent means, you know. It can be in all kind of sense, you know, individually, we all in the same culture experience things in a different way. So the next module, module five, is about gratitude. And a lot of times we take so much for giving what we have, and a lot of times we do not realize how much wealth we already live in. And we have this mentality of coming from lacking instead of, you know, basically halfway, you know, we have a glass, it's either halfway full or half empty empty. And so really what this allowed us to do is just to become clear about what we already have, which are really in tune our mind in a very different gear to build from the awareness of what we can count on and the wealth that we already have created underneath of us. So, you know, we have a beautiful exercise that I'm going to mention very briefly. It's about sitting, you know, thinking about the chair where you're sitting on, you know, how many people, how many resources, how many countries have been involved in that? And, and that is an incredible, you know, if you, if, if we ever feel you know, that something is going wrong in our life, just look around you and think about all the things that they are around you that give you comfort and how many people and how many resources and how much time has been invested to create that comfort in that given moment. And lastly, but not for that less important, is the last module, which is called a compassion, basically is the compassion um, module, which is, you know, in this one, what we learn to do is we all feel this need <clears throat> for, uh, uh, to bring uh, well-being to others. We say it always that it's two side coin. One is love and the other one is compassion. The difference is love comes from the building of the relationship that we create with others when compassion is about feeling the distress of someone and do well for them. And uh, one of the biggest problems that 
you know, especially for us medical interpreters and, and so many people who is supporting others and be well, is that we are the sponge of these emotions, but we don't know what to do with them. We do not have an outlet. We always feel that what we're doing is not enough. You know, and this is so important in the medical field. When people is dealing, you know, doctors, nurses, everybody is taking everybody's pain and then usually become detached, emotionally detached as a mechanism to cope with that. What really, you know, what you're doing is when you disengage from the pain of others, you disengage from your own pain and you become numb and then you, you know, you're not social competent. You might have incredible knowledge, but you not longer social competent because we are natural, you know, social beings. And when you start to behave such, such as that, you know, automatically we break in the humanness within us. So uh, one of the key things about engaged compassion, I mean, uh, uh, engaged empathy is that we need to make a distinction between what a, Empathy is, and what we do with it. <clears throat> the difference between empathy and compassion is that we make a choice about an action that is going to create an impact on the other side. And this is so much into trying now about what, a, you know, what this conversation is, because it's really about taking an action that is within our reach that is going to create an impact. A lot of times we think that we need to cross the ocean when really what we need to do is a small step that is going to really create a difference and then assess and then take another step and then take another step. And that's what really engaged uh, empathy is, you know, which it builds into compassion and really creates the space where we can build a strong foundation where there is transparency in the conversation that we create. The communication is clear. And so we can build and really embrace whoever is in our uh, environment, either work, family, or whatever. And so all that, it has a very strong foundation that is promoting the thriving, not only of us, but that the whole. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. I, and this is why I wanted to have you on the show, um, because I love the, the, not only the exuberance, the excitement you bring about this, this powerful program that you are teaching others, but really, um, I see it coming off of you. Our listeners can hear it resonating in your voice, um, just how important it is. And, and I unpacked a few things um, from what you were, were um, describing with regard to CBCT, because I feel like you gave the listeners um, a really cohesive view about what it is. But some of the things that I unpacked from that myself was that you touched upon unconscious bias. Um, and that's something that, that we mentioned in um, the, the book, my book, Global Fluency. But you mentioned it in the sense of the interpreter coming in, leaving their personal selves outside of the room, right? And, and being present with their interpreter selves, meaning um, we, we take a, away all the biases that we may have. And, we, and most of the time, um, we deal with biases that are conscious, that, that we're aware of, right? But, but there are these deep-seated unconscious biases that sometimes we may not even realize we have until we've experienced um, something that brings them to the table, right? Yes. So I love that you said that we have to leave those outside of the door. And then you're talking about mindfulness 
and anchoring the mind. And I think part of being aware, when you were talking about self-awareness, um, part of that is knowing those unconscious biases, right? Because we can't be, if we're not mindful of them, we cannot deal with them. And then we cannot anchor our mind if we're still clinging to those things, right? And then when you were talking about the third module with regard to self-care and self-compassion, um, with self-care, that's one of the interpreting, um, it's, one, it's a part of the interpreter code, code of ethics. Um, but I also think um, no one talks about self-compassion, right? Um, because it might be seen by, by people who are not familiar too much with it as being self-indulgent, right? Oh, I need to be compassionate to myself. And I heard something that was really poignant the other day, which reminded me of you. Someone was, was getting advice from someone else and they, the person said to them, why is it that you can give me this good advice? Um, and they said, because I love you. And then the person receiving the advice said, but how come, I know you love me, but how come you don't love yourself just as much, right? And that resonated with me because we, we oftentimes do not show ourselves self-compassion, right? And I think when we do, this puts us in a space to be more empathetic to people. So that's what I unpacked from what you were telling me. Um, and of course, I am, I'm minimizing what you just said, but, but those are the, some of the key takeaways. And then when you touched upon social confidence, that, that's something that I hadn't thought about um, at all with regard to, you know, with regard to CBCT. Um, and so having said that, I love the example that you drew on why social confidence is important. And I, I dare say, um, I think that might be an actual, another episode for our podcast, um, simply because I think something such as social competence needs to be delved into even further. Um, but I think in order for us, and, and my connection to this is, in order for us to be socially competent, or, or rather the purpose um, in being socially competent eventually leads us to being culturally competent. Um, because if we're if we're thinking about our place in society, culture does does have a direct relationship with with the society, and and in this case, us in the United States, multiple cultures. So I see how that social competence would play an integral role in how we deal with not only ourselves but with one another. And so my next question for you is, you know, based upon all of this that you've discussed, um, tell me a bit about your experience. Um, on the diversity, with the diversity and inclusion journey. How has that manifested itself in your work? Um, well, in, in my work, I, uh, well, let me focus mostly in my experience. I will go through a lot of things, but I think the medical interpreting is the most accurate because it really is about specifically communication. And we have this illusion about what real communication is. You know, we are so tied up in the form that we deliver and not so much on the content. There is something that for me is so key. You know, there is a huge gap between intention and outcome. You can have the best intention in the world, but if your action is not matching your in your action is not matching your intention, most likely the outcome that you're going to recollect is not showing up you know, the way you want it. In other words, you know, we, we mean all well-being for everybody, you know, and this is tidying up to uh, what you were just telling me about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We all know that we live in a diverse world. Mm -hmm. We all want the well-being, you know, in the abstract way for everybody. You know, we all mean well, but how that shows up in our life you know, and, uh, and for me, for example, I can give tangible examples of this, you know, and inclusion, you know, as a medical interpreter for me, uh, expressing in the way to be the best at whatever I was doing. So that way, transparent communication, you know, accurate and transparent communication can take place. So that way it's like, you know, the barrier of language, it was not even there. So that's the way I can, you know, feel into the inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is that as I'm interpreting all these emotions are moving within me, even though I left, you know, Andrea 
a package at the door because I cannot help but I'm a human being. So uh, it's so key that every time I make a selection of the words or even my body language, which is something that we do not pay attention most of the time, it is so key also in the part of communication. Uh, to be aware of how am I showing up and what I'm bringing into the table. And, and for example, the part of being an interpreter, which is also, you know, when you decide to change from cultural broker to advocate, you know, that is a huge leap. It's a huge leap. And it really, you know, it's a leap that you, want, you don't want to cross very often because it can have all kind of effects. So, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of breach that I was talking about, you know, the use discernment in your choices, because sometimes you think you have to cross the ocean and really all what you need to do is just make a little step. So you can, in, in the context of being an interpreter, which it can be used in so many other ones, but I think it, it is so clear in this type of environment, you know, when you are an excellent, cultural broker is most likely that you will not need to become an advocate. And you are becoming a settled advocate without pursuing the position of an advocate, which it means you remain within the frame of your profession, yet you're having an incredible impact. But in order to do that, you have to be so fully present of whatever's going on. And you have to be also so aware of, you know, of what your tools are and not be masterful because, you know, not, I'm not going to take it to that level, but you really know your tools so you can use them properly in every moment in a way that is going to bring difference without stretching yourself so far. So going, you know, I went a little bit away from what you were asking me, but, you know, going back about diversity and inclusion, you know, my journey has been, that uh, first of all, I need to be clear about my intention and how I'm going to put that into action. Knowing my space, knowing exactly what is my role in the situation and being clear about the frame in which I'm acting up. So thank you for that, Andrea. Um, and with regard to um, knowing your space and, and knowing your role, and knowing your frame, I want to ask you, because you, you work with families, different Hispanic families, um, with regard to interpreting, of course, but also with regard to um, your CBCT training. So explain to me how, um, because as interpreters, um, we, we know that, you know, just to use Spanish as an example, um, being that you are from Argentina, the communities that you serve are not necessarily of your same ethnic and cultural background. So you may serve people from Mexico, from Nicaragua, from, from you know, Panama, from different parts of the world. Um, here in Georgia, um, we have a significant Mexican population. So with that comes not only a difference in culture, but a difference in the type of Spanish that is spoken. So with that comes language variance. So, so my question is, you know, tell us how language variants have affected your interactions with both families and providers on a therapeutic and a cultural level. Okay. Uh, so, well, the, again, it has to do with being humble, you know. Uh, it, when, you, when you're pursuing something, even though you might have an... an there is a difference between knowledge and experience. And the difference between knowledge and experience is that knowledge you accumulate in your head, but until you not apply it in your everyday living, you know, it doesn't become experience. And it's only when it becomes experience has become, you know, wisdom, which really leads into discernment. And I'm just making this line of, you know, of connections because it's really when, um, you constantly interacting with your environment, right? So let's say when I was an interpreting, or even when I'm teaching Spanish too, you know, uh, you constantly receiving inputs from your environment. Now, if you're fully present, 
you're going to get exactly the clue that you need in order to redirect your action so you can aim closer to your outcome. But if you stubborn and you want to fixate, you want to be fixated about something, you know, the gap between your intention and your results is going to grow bigger. Because as, as far as you have present, you are disconnected. And when you are disconnected, you know, something is rolling without you being there. You are physically there, but you're not present to that. And I'm saying that because the impact that it had on me, you know, I could have always you know, pretend that everybody is from Argentina and speak the Spanish that I speak in Argentina. And then probably I will never evolve to become the interpreter that I became because, you know, it, there will have been so many uh, communication issues uh, that probably will, most likely will lead me to not have the kind of business that I built because I was not effective on my, on my profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to language, you know, you have to, the thing is, uh, we a lot of times get tied up in the aesthetical part of something, meaning in the form that shows up versus the ethical part, which is the moral behind it, you know? And so we have to make a choice, which really in the everyday life is the distinction between our ego and our higher self, you know? You know, the, the aspect of us that wants to thrive, you know, a, in a truly and authentic way. So I'm making that distinction because if I want to be, if I want to be attached to the only good Spanish is the Spanish I know, you know, then I'm disengaged from my environment. I'm stuck with a bias that is really filtering my experience and it automatically is isolating me because I'm not connecting to others at the core of what human beings are, you see? And so when I, when I, when I make that connection and I do understand that the, the, the differences that they seem to be so huge, they're not really truthful that big. They are forms. That's what I say, aesthetic. You know, they are forms that are manifesting in the world that they seem to be very different, that they might show up as a consequence of the system of beliefs, which is seem to be from the other side of the universe for me because I feel in that gap, when in reality is not true. In reality, we all thriving for the same thing, which is our well-being. So going back to your question, you know, the way is by surrendering to what my intention is. If I stay in tune to be a good interpreter, then I will do whatever it takes to build that. If I'm stuck to be the Argentine interpreter who is pretending that she's still in Argentina, then, you know, the results are going to be very different. And this is another thing that sometimes we have in this illusional situation where we think that we are behaving away in one way, but underlying we have this, this belief that we have not become aware of, which meditation will allow us to become clear about, you know, that is running the show. And we under the illusion that really the intention that we think it is is running the show when reality is not. And that's why the gap be in between the intention and the outcome. And you know, Andrea, one of the reasons I love talking to you and having discussions with you um, is because there's always a learning and a teaching moment, right? And I, for me, you always take me on a journey, which I, which I always appreciate because as you're speaking, I, I, I'm a visual learner. And so I like to um, visualize that journey, right? Because it's the best way that I can share it with others. And so this is what I unpacked from what you were saying. So at first we need, there is that gap between our intention and our outcome, right? But what I took from you is in order, well, we start out with the intention and then we have to deal with our ego. And so around that area of our ego, that's when we make that decision. If we're going to acquire knowledge or not, if we're going to use that knowledge or not, then the more we do use that knowledge, um, meaning the, the less we deal with our egos, the more that we accept what we don't know and, and are ready to receive what we, what we are given, right? That leads to increasing and expanding our experiences, right? And the more experiences we have, that leads to our being able to discern. And then for me, where, where that goes even further 
is that with that discernment comes a cultural awareness. So like you were saying, you know, with that discernment, you're, you're like thinking to yourself, I'm not in Argentina, but I serve other people who speak Spanish, maybe not even as their first language, especially in the case of indigenous speakers, but I serve other people. So, so that means that you have to make yourself aware that, you know, the Spanish that you are, are so well versed in may not be applicable to the people you're, you're serving, right? And then that leads us to cultural humility, knowing that we are culturally aware, but knowing that we will never know it all but the journey still continues. And that leads us to what you were saying about your higher self, right? Because then we're able to fully embrace our higher selves. And that is where, after doing that, that's where we're able to really have our outcome um, present itself. So for me, from what you were saying, that was the journey I saw from my intention to my outcome. You know, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I want to just kind of thank you for, you know, bringing all those highlights. But I want to share with, uh, with you and the audience uh, something that Martin Luther King said, you know. And I'm going to read that, this to you. So people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Uh, if, if we keep this in mind, we could truly begin to see the other without fear and less of a stranger. If we have, to pe if we have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, our nation. And this means we must develop a world perspective. Wow. Wow that truer things could not be said. Truer things could not be said. So Andrea, let, let's bring this home for our listeners out there. So if there are two things besides that, that beautiful gem from Martin Luther King that you just um, gave us, if there are two things you would like to impart upon our listeners, what would those two things be? Well, you know, I would say that practice self-care, impartiality, and gratitude will lead to a state of awareness and discernment that promotes social competence and more effectively communication and making choices that leading to thriving to the whole, and that can be your company, your family, your, you know, whatever setting you choose. That will be one of them. And the other one is to be willing to convert your empathetical concern into an action of compassion that will bring well-being to you and for those around you, which it will lead to build a stronger relational foundation in which anything can be built on top. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Andrea. So for our listeners out there, I know that this has been impactful for me. How is it impactful for you? Um, let me know. Um, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this. And also, um, I challenge you to continue this conversation, continue the conversation um, and explore really um, the, the gap between your intention and your outcome. And if there is that gap that exists, what is stopping you from getting the outcome that you intended? So let's have that um, be something that we explore um, as an audience together. So Andrea, if, if our listeners want to reach out to you, if they have a question, tell us where they can find you. Okay, uh, my website is prolingualspanish.com. My email address is agarcia at prolingualspanish.com. You can find me on Instagram uh, with uh, Meditation with Andrea. You can find me also in, uh, uh, in Facebook uh, as uh, Prolingual Spanish and Meditation with Andrea. And I think I cover all. And where can we find you on LinkedIn? Oh, thank you. LinkedIn, you can find me as Andrea Garcia or Prolingual Spanish, either way. Excellent. Excellent. So Andrea, as your friend, as your colleague, I thank you so much for being on the show today. I know I'm speaking on behalf of all of our listeners when I say thank you for sharing of yourself so willingly and so um, selflessly. Thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise. And really, I'm excited to see what you're going to do with CBCT, how you're going to continue to, to have it reach other people and impact them. And so 
for our listeners out there, continue the conversation. I'm Bertine Crevacore West, and I will see you on the next episode of Global Fluency Podcast. Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very, very thrilled to it. Thank you. So to all of our listeners, we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.